This is the Lydia and Spin with Lydia Lunch and uh, Timothy Seymour Dahl. Hello, my friend. Hello. How's it going? Uh, I'm uh, going in circles, but that's fine. I'm yeah. used to it. Kind so of call- and myself. That's why it's called the Lydia and Spin. No, I love it. I will absolutely it go, love it. Will it go around in circles? <laughs> will it fly uh, high like a bird up in yeah. the sky? Well, well, maybe I'll I'll be a circle jerk today. How about that? Oh, can Roar. I join? Oh, no, I yes, you yes you can. I'd like to lead the pack. As a matter of fact, Tim, you always Please seem do. to know. You always seem to know exactly where I'm going with this, and oh, we don't good. discuss. The question of the day is: sure. What if any are the ethics of an implant that delivers pleasure directly into your brain? I'm all for it. Now, a growing number of scientists believe that a sort of feel good button. A device that can be implanted into your brain and automatically trigger feelings of pleasure could become reality in the surprisingly near future. Oh, boy. I cannot wait. Now, research stemming from clinical experimentation indicates that the controversial tech is uh, pretty much already on its way. Some scientists that have been conducting these studies think that neural stimulation done purely for recreational purposes will not only be possible, but that it will be a big hit with the public. Hey, sign me up. University of Michigan biomedical engineer Tim Brun said, there are people recreationally using electrical stimulation in several ways. Hear ye, hear ye. Brun's conducted several landmark studies that used electrical stimulation on specific nerves, I do it almost every night, in order to treat and improve bladder function. And he soon realized that these exact same stimulations near the bladder and mysteriously enough on the ankle also seem to treat sexual dysfunction disorders that make it difficult to experience arousal, especially in women, which is, uh, come on, we know that it's absolutely a subject that is underfunded and very difficult to find funding for female sexual pleasure. We don't right. have the Viagra, okay? Right. Uh, we do have every kind of, we do it. Well, no, I look, you know, you can have your Viagra. We have had all kinds of goodies in the bedside drawer. Sure. So anyway, they're not, they don't really give money for female sexual function or arousal right. unless it's involved with spinal cord injury, which is bizarre. But anyway, Bruns and his colleagues believe that a recreational consumer friendly version will not be far behind. And quote uh, Douglas Weber of Carnegie Mellon, he said, look, it's already happening. You can find many neurostimulation devices on Amazon. Some will make you stronger, relieve your pain, help you lose weight. Some claim to even make you smarter. What's interesting is Weber, who was Brun's former postdoctoral advisor, added he expects that more neurostim, as they're called neurostim devices, will be developed that will offer real and valuable benefits to consumers. I mean, they've also done uh, experiments on these implants to get rid of depression. And like uh, you get an electrical trigger 300 times a day, and it's actually. I'm just wondering whether, you know. So, I mean, sort of like taking MDMA, if you take too much, you know, what, what is it that's released? I mean, your, your receptors are being blasted. Well, and then after a while, the, there's a go- the, this yeah, is the yeah. ethical fear is, of course, the mind naturally wanders to sex and pleasure derived from electrical stimulation, as we all know, can take many forms. But, you know, and the massaging by powerful electrical impulses, dopamine, using technology, electrical probe in the brain. I don't think there's an issue. I think it would be fantastic to have a little tiny device that nobody knows you're wearing that you could auto stimulate, especially out of depression, anxiety, or rage. And why not into sexual? Well, it, but, but the thing yeah. is, in terms of what the body receives and what it gets used to, I mean, our addiction to sugar, for instance, and, and, if, and if you look at a, um, MRI of a, of a cocaine or amphetamine fueled brain, it's, it's, it's lighting up in the same places as sugar. I mean, all these things can be great, right? I mean, you can experience well, all these I, things and enjoy I, all these things, but, but I, I mean, moderation. So inevitably people would get addicted uh, to this Timothy pleasure Dahl, button. Timothy Dahl, moderation coming from your mouth is an oxymoron if I've ever heard it, but I am not that, making, I am not uh, making an ethical judgment. Not. Hey. Or a moral statement. I'm just talking about the reality hey, of some people. Uh, some people will glut on Fruit Loops. You know what can I say? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I think Simon would if there was a box of Fruit Loops in the house. How long, oh, Simon? Do you think a, a box of Fruit Loops would last in your house? I mean, not long. I mean, if if, if it has a lot of sugar in it uh, and it's it uh, candy Simon and finger food, it's the, gone. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, yeah. When, when Simon and I lived together, I I, I, I had this epiphany. I was like. 
Oh, right. And it was all ultimately healthy. It was actually healthy living this time because um, he ate pre- all the junk. <laughs> well, pre pre made food, pre made processed food, stuff that you didn't have to put effort into making. That's pretty much gone when you live with Simon. Because I mean, you just right there, grab it and eat All it. All right, people can change. I I some cook some meals once or twice a week. So, Simon Slater, like Timothy, Dalton, like myself, Simon is an excellent chef. Let's not forget the Christmas duck goose, whatever it was. Well. With foul, he's uh, he's <laughs> right at home. Right. <laughs> Choice of words. <laughs> he's, he is a foul weathered, feathered oh, yes. friend. Oh yes. Well, speaking of food, there was an absolute epic food fight riot at a uh, Golden Corral in uh, Pennsylvania. Um, you know, people are just lined up. You know, there's a few like kind of gems that people are going after. It's usually like king crab legs and and steak and and so the, the steaks were coming out it was probably some cow chewing hide leather boot but it doesn't really matter i mean what was this wait, 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 wait was this like a sale a special or just no, like- no 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 so golden corral if you don't know it's like I a know. buff it's like a bu- it's a buffet oh, it's a okay. buffet chain where people go and then they pay x amount of money and that's all you can eat now, for the people that are really into it, you know, you know, you think there's only so much you can eat before you're just like, I'm just done. Well, there are people that will plant their their, their hineys there and sit there for like five, six hours and just kind of chipping away. But then there's also people that are like, OK, fine, the French fries and all that other stuff. There's a few items that you, you really want to get your money's worth or, you know, you there's the people that want to, well, there's people who want to eat more than what they paid. Okay, I, let me just interrupt for one second, because a woman uh, last week, I read that a woman at a at one of these buffets actually ate herself into the hospital and she was a rather oh. thin and petite thing. Oh, no, I, mean, I, I read about that, too. That, that was that was an all you can eat uh, sushi, sushi. <laughs> sushi I think it was in California and, or I don't maybe it was Texas. I don't know. And, and uh, yeah, I actually saw an interview with her. She made a, the international news uh, and she just. Castle Wolfenstein is my, I mean, the problem is uh, if you're not doing it with sashimi, which by the way, t- that much raw fish, I wouldn't do it either. But if you're doing with sushi, that rice is expanding. And so I think that's what happened with her. It's just like, she just jammed it down there before her stomach even knew like, Hey, what's going on here? Well, also that, on, a, on a scientific note, I mean, not only was the rice expanding, but if it had been sitting out there for more than two hours, it has such a high bacterial content that that's mostly when people think they get sick from Chinese food, they're getting sick from the rice. It's yeah. That, 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 was, that was, that wasn't uh, a good right, idea for her. Up, oh, yeah. All up right. So, so the golden corral. So, so, you know, everyone's like, Ooh, the steak's coming out. And there's, they kind of line up, lining up. Cause that, that's kind of like a made to order one. It's not just like plopped on the, the, the heat dishes. You know, I want this. And some guy uh, said, I want my crappy filet mignon. I think it was like a low grade. I want it medium rare. And the guy behind is like, I'll take that. And like reached over and grabbed the other guys made or even though there's plenty to go around. And then the place exploded. There's video of it. I mean, people were using chairs as weapons. I mean, it was 40 people like were arrested. I mean, they just went insane over steak that they would all just eventually get. I think people are on edge, you know, people are on edge. I mean, you know, it's one thing when you hear about these, you know, brain fuckingly stupid incidences that happen at a drive through McDonald's or they don't have a Slurpee or right. I mean, but I mean, it's just uh, but I mean, please, ten years, people. ten years ago, uh, that was happening a lot of Chuck E. Cheese's, <laughs> um, you know, it, it, I don't know why, but but it was a lot of giant moms. Like, yeah, fuck you, you know, because they're they're managing like these birthday parties of like 15 screaming kids and they're like stressed out. Dad's not around. And then the moms start attacking each other. But- well, you know, as as I've said before, I mean, a gut and brain connection. If you're eating crap all the time, you're going to start thinking like an asshole. Well, I mean, Chuck E. Cheese, the, the, the pizza was crap. It, it was originally designed. I think Atari owned it. Uh, it. It was a market research for video games. And they just like, let's just like bring animatronics, like characters in and crappy pizza. And then all these kids are going to play video games all the, all the whole time. And we can see what's the most popular. Well, Besides, you know, st- yeah. Stupidity is not necessarily contagious, but I actually, I don't think it, it might be. But this is uh, for any, any of you unfortunate listener, listeners that may have felt you've had brain fog. Sorry to anybody oh, who's had to deal with with COVID. There is something actually even worse. Uh-oh. Tyson Tyson botanist was horrified to find out that he had contracted Cladophyllophora bantiana, an extremely rare, tro- 
extremely rare tropical fungus that if it gets into your brain can cause a number of severe neurological problems. And most often, I mean, most 70% of the people who get it die. So his doctors were shocked that he's still alive that other than having a stroke two years ago and having to go off steroids because they suppressed his immune system, he's not doing too bad. But he believes botan botanist, <laughs> the botanist, he believes that he contracted the fungus while biking through a particularly dusty part of Costa Rica. That he had, a, he had a minor crash after letting some air out of his tires to ride on the beach. And he thinks somehow that crash, I don't know, he inhaled the sand, a move that in hindsight he believes may have altered his, the trajectory of his life radically forever. So after he returned home to Rhode Island and he was just, you know, he was developing a lot of just very weird neurological symptoms. And after many MRIs, it revealed an O-shaped anomaly on his brain. Ooh. And over the course of eight months, which included biopsies, spinal taps. His oh. doctors finally sleuthed out the terrifying origin of his issues, an abscess of black mold. Oh my God. On the brain. Oh. Now, infection from this fungus is very rare because bloodborne diseases like this generally don't get to the brain because of the blood brain barrier. You know, that the cellular system that make up the vessels and organs, which blood circulates through and usually keeps harmful substances like fungus out of the brain. But unfortunately, his uh, medications were not getting into his brain either. So they don't think he's going to die if he has it yet from the fungus. But then he had <laughs> resigned to it. He just said, well, if anything, I've learned what it's like to be on the forefront of scientific research. It's a lonely perch. Oh, oh my God. God! Poor God! Black mold on the. I mean, that's well, that that, that that's brain barrier. The there's, there's something about COVID that, that's penetrating that, that. That's why the brains that are brain. swelling. It, it's, well, uh, who knows? Uh, Might all end up with black black mold on the brain. Oh my God! I mean, that, yeah, yuck, yuck, yuck. Well, um, let's see here because I got a few stories uh, more. Um, this company in Sweden that's training crows to pick up cigarette butts that are on the street and, and it's working. They're, they're, they're like in these like experiments and they're going to these villages and basically clean up 70% of the cigarette butts on the hot sidewalks and street. Are they, I didn't get to this part. Do they, are they rewarding the crows? Like why? <laughs> Cause, Cause these are wild crows. Like why are the crows fucking doing this? Uh, they must be rewarding them. But is that, is that like good for the thing just, is, are they getting addicted to nicotine? That's the question. Maybe who knows? But I mean, is, you know, yeah, what exactly. I, one of my favorite animal stories, and I, I love this, and I don't understand, well, America behind everything, why behind and and not as advanced as some other places. I love the training of bees to sniff out COVID, which can be done, and the training, of course, of dogs to dogs, sniff out yep. cancer, or, cancer or COVID. So I, I just think, I mean, come on. Let's, how, I mean, let's do this. Well, I mean, I mean, there's, there's, uh, there's rumors it's never been declassified. It was pretty well known that dolphins have been trained to find mines uh, in this in the oceans and stuff like that. Right. And they, rat, they, they, rats they, finding landmines, all, all, all that stuff. Uh, yeah, the, the, that that one hero rat died a couple <laughs> weeks ago. Now, one thing that's not going to find shit are these um, iguanas. That you know, it's been raining iguanas oh, oh, terrible. in, in, in Florida yeah. because, because they had it was so unseasonably cold. In Southern Florida, one night it got below freezing, got down to 25. It just never happens. Now, at around 50 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, because they're cold blooded, iguanas kind of go into this kind of sluggish. Blah, blah. But once it gets below freezing, they go, they can go into these coma states and they're falling out of trees, landing on people like, what the hell? Now, for all you iguana lovers out there, 99 out of 100 times they're out. It's really fine. Once it warms up, they're like, hey, what happened? <laughs> just the idea of, uh, you know, iguanas get pretty big, like one falling out of a tree and landing on you. Now, Lydia, was it you or Bob? There, there's coconuts. No, right? that, we, 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 we were, we, Tim, we, Tim, Bob, why would it be me who almost well, it, it killed never, by coconuts? Well, you know, I know because it maybe because you deflected it being almost killed. But yes, <laughs> we, we, I, was, I was walking with you in Miami once after a show. And I, but I think it happened twice on that tour, right? Where Bob would walk and like one inch from him, like a fucking coconut that just fell. 50 fucking feet smashes. I could have if, like if he would have had a heart on, he would have been in the hospital. I mean, yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. Well, <laughs> right. That well, was too you know, fast like, for me. They're, they're, 
There's a lot of hot asses walking down the streets in Miami. You never know. You could pop one without knowing. It. Oh, my God. What I mean, I mean the ass implant scene on South Beach, it's just at what point it's just the clownery. It's just it's just, it's just so absurd. It's, Tim, it's like if the, I'm going to implant something in my ass, it's not going to be the cheeks. I remember sitting at one of these Cuban restaurants <laughs> and we were sitting outdoors and some some woman was kind of walking with her kind of big muscles boyfriend and I mean, her ass it was clearly uh, cosmetic surgery. Enhanced. Result of yeah, enhanced the augmentation of the butt cheeks. I don't think she could sit. I don't I could. I was, I was checking out. I was like, can this person even sit? Like, how's that even fucking work? And well, there's other questions you can even ask. We can go further with that. Um, so. Mathugala, it's the world's oldest living aquarium fish. Um, it's in San Francisco, but it's a Queensland, Australia, uh, lungfish, which is basically, uh, they're, they're, they're they they want to do all these tests on this thing. They, they think it's about 70 something years old. You know, there's other fish that live longer in the wild, but in an aquarium, I mean, it, it's, they think it's the oldest one and it, they do know it, uh, the records. It was brought into San Francisco in 1938. Uh, wait, that'd be older. That's older than 70. So the math is wrong. Um, but I wrote that down correctly. So that thing. Uh, would... All right. We know it's old. I, 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 that's old. Anyhow, they want to do studies, but that's still that's still going. People love it. Heather Garcia was celebrating her 30th birthday. She's thinking, hey, I should I should be responsible. I got five fucking kids. She had five. Uh, I have five kids. I'm not going to drink and drive for my 30th birthday. Why don't I get one of these party buses? So they're, uh, you know, there's like a disco ball on the thing. Is this in all... Florida? Where, where is this happening? Los Angeles. All right. So so they go out, you know, the party bus is like, OK, we're going to change neighborhoods. And well, while you're in L.A. So they get on the freeway and well, she's like doing some kind of fancy dance move and she, and her high heels and she's wasted and she falls backwards and basically goes flying through uh, the, the kind of one of the rear exit doors. Onto the freeway, uh, immediately smushed by the car behind oh, her, uh, and, and and then you know that that guy stuck around and wasn't a hit and run, but it was like you know the whole thing was a tragedy. But I don't know. Have you ever even been on a party bus? I, I mean, the idea of dancing and I I, I just all I never, right. now never saw trying, the appeal. All right, T- Tim, you're trying to dig into my past. I wouldn't. I wouldn't a party bus. I've been on a few rock and roll buses. Well, well I mean, uh, our bus is our buses on the road are part well, the real oh, party come, bus. I mean, you're not. That's a minivan, honey. And, well, you know, the, I call anybody, it the party. If, any, if anybody's dancing, it's on their back, trying not to throw up. Uh, well, you remember one of the early tours? We had that thing called Death Bunk, where I because I because I, I, I would be partying all night and I and then I would sleep on the ride to the next gig in this bunk. But like, if anything happened, I'd be like just fucking rocketed forward and go through that glass. But uh, Death bu- Bunk, I had some of my best sleeps on the road on in death punk well because you were as close to death as you probably ever got so therefore, <laughs> uh, correct i mean and tim what i have to what i have to commend you about is you will suffer for your pleasure and the pleasure of others i myself prefer not to suffer not to have a hangover can't remember the last time i did i just don't get hangover so therefore i'm not in the death bunk i'm not That's on my true. back trying not to vomit i'm uh, doing pretty good yes I'm you are you're doing great you're doing Perfectly. I think we're all doing good here. All right. Well, um, can we know. go on? Can we? Yeah, go up? ahead. Yeah, we tie yeah, it up right. to me. All right. Yeah, we can. I'm very happy to have Brian Lewis Saunders on this show. Absolutely, one of my top two, maybe even my number one favorite spoken word artist. And you can check him out on Bandcamp. Absolutely favorite performance artist, and just one of the most interesting and speak about experiments and we'll be describing some of those experimental artists, visual artists who's done a self portrait every day of his life since 1995. I just find his life and his spirit so incredibly interesting. And I'm very happy to present him on the show. This is the Lydian spin with Lydia lunch, Tim Dahl and Brian Lewis Saunders. This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, and Brian Lewis Saunders, who's, I have to say, 
one of my favorite conceptual artists, definitely my favorite spoken word artist, uh, an amazing release his books, has released many recordings. There are a lot of them are on Bandcamp and you can go to his website and purchase some of his books. When I say that he's experimental, it's more like he's experiential as well, because his whole life that he has taken and used in experiments to create art in order to, I think, keep himself out of the institution, which he once had to go to. Is that you in a nutshell? Yep. <laughs> yep, you got it. <laughs> Brian has done a self-portrait every day of his life, sometimes more than once since 1995. Yeah, March will be uh, 27 years, over half my life. I don't think there's any living or dead artist that has created so much Artwork. I want to go back to the to the just the beginning of your life. Also, I want to say that you call what you I know you don't do so much stand up or spoken word anymore, but you call it like I call it stand up tragedy. Yeah, there's <laughs> not, not many of us out there. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> because we're so popular. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Brian, you live in Johnson City, Tennessee. You, yep. were, you, were you born in Johnson City? No, I was born in D.C., uh, but then grew up in uh, northern Virginia area outside D.C. And then um, when I was six, I went to Long Beach and then got uh, sand thrown in my face by all the kids. And then it, they were making me too mean, my mom said, in, in uh, Long Beach. And Which so Long back. Beach? Which Long California, Beach? California. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it was really rough on me. She said, well, see, they were trying to get me to advance, uh, skip grades, but the kids were already like beating me down and stuff at six years old. So right. she wouldn't let me skip it, which was probably worked out better in the long run, but she was afraid they were making me mean as like a mean baby or something. So we moved back to Northern Virginia. What one of your what one of your spoken word pieces is if my mother and I were monkeys, I would be dead by now about her lack of physical affection to you as a child. I yeah. mean, we can start right in with the I mean, you know, a lot of our lives begin with the neglect or the abuse of our parents. So definitely. Uh, yeah, I, she didn't. We haven't never really talked about it. She still doesn't like to touch but um when i was younger my grandparents would tell me that um like if i went to like hug her or, or even no even when she was a baby uh if they touched her if they like put her hand on her knee or something she would just like pick it off of them and just didn't want to be touched at all so then when she had me she didn't feel like I would need touch or something it probably didn't even cross her mind or something because that's the type of person she was you know well, I always say that and people don't recognize this as much as they they recognize, you know, sexual, psychological, physical abuse. But neglect is abuse yeah. is a devastating form of abuse. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's really it, it shaped me, but I wouldn't go if I had the choice to go back and then have a different upbringing, I wouldn't do it. Even all the terrible stuff I did and the terrible stuff that was done to me, it's just made me who I am and I'm comfortable enough with it, you know? So when you're touched now by someone that maybe you have feelings for, how, how do you react in general? It's intense as hell. It's like really super intense. Uh, the girlfriend that I've had now, Nicole, for like probably 12, 15 years or so now, she, um, we did a, a ex series of experiments together called Sensations, where we each touched each other like different types of things could be like nibbling on the ear or something sexual. Uh, and then we, but we didn't look at the other person's drawings and we did it like one at a time. And then we put them side by side to compare the differences. And um, it was interesting how she experienced sensations more as like a floating phenomenon, not really grounded to her body, this little, focused on the places and stuff and like all over patterns and everything. But for me, it was like really super like intense. It's hard to explain, but like, like uh, an electrical invasion. Yeah. And uh, 
pain, and I used to really be attracted to pain, not like necessarily a masochistic thing, but um, whenever I would be drawing myself portraits, if I felt a pain, the, oh, oh, my knee hurts, that's my inspiration, I'll start with my knee, or oh, if I got a headache, well, I'll start there. Like, it just was some type of um, root founding uh, sensory well, principle you, to get you, me started. You, you took that much further in, in some of your uh, are, I'm going to call them movements. I don't I don't know what else to call them. But first, I want to start with you've had intense physical pain, like your lung bur bursting. Yeah. Uh -huh. What the hell? Can, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's probably from huffing uh, from aldehyde and stuff as a 10 year old. I'd say it didn't help my lungs much. <laughs> but they actually. <laughs> <laughs> when, was, when was the last time you did inhaling? I don't know. It's probably been about around maybe 2001 or so, maybe I'd say. Do you want to just leave your reality or did you just like the high or both? Well, well, when I was a kid, I wanted to break my brain all the time. I just I didn't I think my brain wasn't formed. And so it was having problems forming. And so then I was constantly not liking where it was and so I was always trying to break it but I didn't really do I don't know how to explain it, it but I I did stuff like I smoked cigarettes starting when I was 10 too and um, you know uh, the choking game kids would play this game where you'd pass out and stuff and and then as I we, we got older we would do it and we would like get high and then play the choking game or then do acid and play the choking game and then have like these pseudo spiritual experiences where you are having a seizure while you're tripping and stuff <laughs> But I, I just always like to break my brain. But now I've I love my brain and I've gotten real healthy and kind of sane. But now I'm wanting to break it in more uh, precise ways and pay attention to what's happening and like learn about it more. I, we're going to we're going to go into these very specific ways because in just, uh, you know, I didn't I didn't read every sentence in the five PDFs you sent me about your different phases of creation with the, the self portraits. But we're going to get into them in a minute. I just want to go back to. So I know you were bullied as a kid. You did go to school. What would you go to prison for? Um, I stabbed a punk rocker in on M Street in Georgetown and um I got in trouble for that. And uh, was he bothering you or? Well, he, he wanted to fight, but there was a girl that I was with and she was um, she had been uh, robbing people. And then the guy was coming to the defense of the women. And then I didn't want to look like a pussy in front of the women. And so then I went to his side of the street and then we were fighting and everything. And then um, he I noticed when he was trying to fight me, he was like bent down and swinging his arms like a windmill at me and stuff. But then by like the th I was really drunk, but then by like the third time I realized he had a straight razor, like one of those folding razors in his hand. And then all the people started coming out from all the bars saying, fuck him up, fuck him up. Don't let that motherfucker stick you. Don't fuck him up, Joe, fuck him up like that. And then I had a butterfly knife in my pocket and I just pulled it out and I started, started poking him a bunch. He didn't die or anything. Self-defense. And, and the cops came immediately and arrested you? No, what happened was uh, I, I ran behind the girls and then I threw my knife in the sewer so no one could see where I ditched it at. I made sure to like slow down and run behind them. But then we, we went like in a square and I wanted to, I wanted to go back and see what happened like to that guy or whatever. That's like, classic. Like, yeah. And, and I really did. And I went to there, but then he was gone, but then they already had the APB out and everything like that. So how long did you have to go and do time there for? Well, if I was black, I would have gotten 15 to 45. Uh, but because I was white, they uh, gave me two years with eight months time served. In D.C., um, they had uh, you only had to do uh, uh, a third of your sentence. But then uh, because it was a violent crime, I was only in the D.C. jail for two weeks. And then they sent me to the uh, prison. Lorton. It's, it's not there anymore. It's, it's now an art center. <laughs> <laughs> so if you, if you had not stuck around the crime scene you, you think you would have never would have got caught probably no you probably would never have been caught wow no. most criminals but, get busted for the dumbest things yeah uh but uh, it, 
I went and I ended up getting my GED and stuff. Like part of my sentence was getting my GED and different things. I would have never gone to college if I hadn't have ever gone to prison. So, well, I, I wanted to ask you that because you know, you not only you went to college for five years and you got a BFA, which is kind of incredible. For I think it's pretty incredible. And that is, is that when you started your series of daily self portraits? Yeah, right in the middle, like by the third year or something. And then I didn't want to do any assignments anymore. I only wanted to do self portraits uh, because I felt like everything, like the, whatever your, this was in the mid nineties. And so they were, I, I think it was pretty, this is how they did it back then. I don't know if they still do, but they were like, everyone is different. And so if you like go inside yourself, you can find out who you are and then you'll have like a different drawing style. This is what they would say. So if you were like a, a male, white male homosexual, they would say, OK, what about being white male homosexual is different for you and focus on that, put that in your art. And then this is going to make you have a different style and stuff like that. But I wanted to keep experimenting. And thought, well, I can be whatever I want. I can experience all these different things. And so then I thought, I don't need to do all of this type of stuff. I really didn't believe in styles at all because I felt like if everyone can have one, then they're not really that valuable. You know, like if if, if there's a billion styles with a billion different concepts behind them, nothing's really being communicated too much. I, I just felt like something like that. And so then I said, well, I'm going to do myself every day differently and see what's different in the, about the world and the environment and stuff like that. And then uh, I don't want to do any of these assignments. So it was like brutal getting through that college. It was really brutal because they, they said, oh, you have all these hoops you have to jump through. And I just did not want to. I already knew what I wanted to do. When did you start doing the endurance uh, experiments to further your 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 portraits? Because you've done a few different series like you did. You did being blind for a month, which was incredible. You did a temperature one, which is extremes of temperature and how that affects the body. You did the color one where you would just be in a certain color light for a month or 30, 20 or 30 days at a time. You did another series where it was about arousal, but you were using your penis <laughs> as part of the uh, as part of the equipment that made the drawings. So you went through these different and some of these experiments were really extreme. I mean, even just we'll start with the it doesn't drug one could have been drug one could have been dangerous and the drug yeah. one let's start with the blind one i mean first of all to be blind for 30 days and reading through that because we just take sight for for granted yeah um the first i'd done a month before like maybe in 2004 where like every time i drew a picture for a month, I was like either blindfolded or in the dark or we had my eyes closed or something like that. But then when I, I thought, oh, I should just be blind for the whole month that came later, it's kind of been slowly developing first. Well, the very first one was in school. I think I'd heard about Chris Burden locker piece where he was in a gym locker for five days. And I had uh, one of my friends chain me into a, a recycled trash can for three days. And then, but that was just like a one-off type of thing for school. And then uh, after I got out of school, I did um, 30 days in the yellow floodlights, 24 hours a day uh, for 30 days and just eight eight uh floodlights just really burning you with you can't get away from that intense light and then but the reason why i started that was because i, I was living in an office uh, space and so it was all fluorescent lights and i'd realized they were making my pictures really crazy with this like silver and reflection and it's just just that static that, uh, fluorescent yeah. lights create so much electrical static it's it's you're being fried what color eyes do you have a uh, blue yeah, I have blue eyes to it and fluorescent lights. I think light eyes, um, they absorb fluorescent lights differently because, you know, when I've gone to like Japan and stuff, everything's fluorescent light. It's really bright everywhere. And I'm just like, I don't know, maybe I can't take this. I, I feel like the pigment in my eyes maybe might be part of it. I Burning or something. Yeah. yeah Does yeah. it burn you? It, it just it's um makes me feel unsettled. It makes you feel uncomfortable. I, I, I don't. My eyes hurt when it's overcast. 
Oh, and wow. I have blue eyes too. Oh, yeah, wow. the reflection, the reflection of the light in a different way. Or something. I, I don't know. Ah. So, talk some more about these co- color experiments, Brian, because they really start to affect you physically. Certainly, they affect your emotions. I mean, we all know about seasonal affliction disorder, and it was interesting in one of one of your color phases that you said maybe if you would have tried the blue, which was starting to make you depressed in the summer, it would have had a different effect. Oh yeah, because I would have gotten a double dopamine factor it, it didn't even cross my mind and um well when i first did the yellow month i was like oh i have so much more patience now like this is like calming or something but this was coming directly after floodlights i mean once i put up the yellow lights the floodlights i mean the fluorescent lights weren't there anymore so it was probably a shock to my system but then by the time I did the red, I did the red light, the red month next, and then it was like just really uh, or- ornery or really super, almost psycho agitation. And then I, th- I, would, I you still- have any t- would you have any time off in between? Would you take a few days off or did you just go into the next color? I th- well, after the yellow one, I think I pretty much went straight to red. And then when I did, because I was going to do I knew about Picasso's pink and blue period. So I thought, well, I'm going to have a primary period where I'll do red, yellow, or yellow, red, and blue. And then, um, but the red one, when I went out uh, of the space, the whole fucking world was green. My skin was green. The air, I could see the air, and the air was green. Like every single thing was green where I'd burn out my red rods or something, or red cones. I'm not sure which one, but it, it really, and I thought, oh gosh, I've ruined myself and everything. But then it, it came back. And then um, I tried blue, and then the blue was just, it really made me feel super shriveled up and like a little elf in a cave or something. Just really, I just did not feel good at all. That was like the least interesting drawings of all. But then during the pandemic, when the when that started, years, this was years later after the first three colors, then I did the pink quarantine. And, um, I and did by, the way, by, by the way, Brian, before you even begin, because I know where this is going, because I read about the pink phase, I hate pink lights. I never allow them on stage or green, green or pink. I do not want them on stage. Pink is used in institutions a lot. They say it calms you down. It does not calm me no, down. No. I hate it. It doesn't calm you down either. You no. went into the pink phase during the quarantine. Yeah. And the reason why was because of that institutional thing, because they, they have that one special pink called Baker Miller pink, and it's sold as trying to calm people down and prisoners and stuff, but it only works for like two hours or something. And then after that, it has an adverse effect. But I wanted to see if I could actually actually make it work by adapting to it and um but what ended up happening was I ended up doing it for 57 days because the first 27 days was all spent worrying about how am I going to get my food cleaned and delivered to me and how am I going to do this different stuff you really became very upset when the when the virus struck didn't you it really it really sent you for a loop yeah, because of my lungs. Uh, I've only got half of a lung on this side. So I was That's like really scary. freaked out. And then my biological father, the real psychopath of the family, I'd never met him uh, since like age six or 12 or something a very, very long time ago. Never heard from him. And then he sends me as soon as a virus hits, he sends me a Facebook friend request. And all this time, Nicole's like, you need your father's health information. You need to find out if he's got prostate cancer, or what if he's got diabetes and all this stuff, you need to find this out. So I thought, okay, I'll accept it. And then, oh my God, this guy was, <laughs> it was bad news. So then that, and then he was constantly like freaking out because of his, he said he had asthma but he was constantly paranoid about the virus and everything i ended up having to block him and all kinds of stuff he was a real piece of shit so that's best he was out of most of your life i mean yeah. be, be, i mean like i like to say sometimes when you have bad parents there's nothing like when they're finally dead what that's was really, his motivation why really, did he want to contact you i think he was just scared death. to death of the virus though he was like this is gonna be like the Grim Reaper killing thousands of people. Or just, I don't remember. He was just like, really, it was like revelations type of thing, but he wasn't biblical, but he was just like that type of scare. 
weird. And then, um, but when he first, when I first accepted, this is crazy. When I first accepted, he only had like a few pictures of him. But then like over time, once he saw my uh, Black Lives Matter or something profile, he, he put up pictures of himself wearing KKK stuff and oh. like, just like wow. real, he started making like racist type of jokes, not like real blatant, but still like Come shitty on. jokes and stuff. And then um, well, I went, I thought, oh, well, let me look through his pictures like this. This is then I saw where he had taken um he was, fe- he was feeding a moose. He was living up north somewhere. There was a lot of trees and snow and he was feeding a wild moose. And then he started, he got to where he could put the food in his mouth and then kiss the wild moose. And then the next pictures were him at this bedspread of this moose fur. And then I was like, yeah, I, I'm going to block this guy's a real piece of shit. He's a sick person. Right, so. and, okay, Brian, and I have to cut, <laughs> I have to cut in, Brian, because one of your, mo- one of your most absolutely gripping pieces and i think it might have been the piece i heard first and we're going to talk about how we met right now going to talk about how we met but was i quit and this piece i quit which is on your near-death experience on Bandcamp, brian lewis saunders on Bandcamp, which is about working and it starts off animals don't have feelings and it's about you working in a animal uh, laboratory testing shampoos and chemicals and of course animals have feelings and it's, it's and this piece is so devastating I, I actually played it for a friend of mine the other day and she started crying because we all love animals anyway tim lo- always tells stories about animals on the podcast but it's in the end the point is how fucked they are and that you fucking quit because they're the ones that are really doing the torture every every, animals are being tortured for everything from shampoo to potato chips (laughs) yeah and they but that's what they teach this medical students they they uh that piece started because a medical student was at a coffee shop drinking beer saying animals don't feel pain animals can't feel pain their brains aren't the same they 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 don't. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he's like, yeah, they don't have, they don't have the pain receptor cells and stuff. And I was just like, wow, this is really crazy. But that's, I guess that's what they do. And then they tell them, don't look at the animal's eyes and everything, but you have to, if you're putting droppers in them and stuff, it's like really just, just detached, like dissociative or something. They have to. I don't know when or how I don't remember exactly when or how you contacted me, Brian, or I think I was living in Spain at the time. But I think you just asked me, how do I get some spoken word shows? And I'm like, well, send me something. And I think you might have sent me I quit or uh, hide and play dead. Another another favorite. And the thing is, I said, well, look, I can start by just making you some flyers. Try try that. Yeah. Because I think you were banned. Yeah. I think you were banned from doing from stuff. the coffee shop. Yeah. <laughs> from where I started. But then with your help and uh, another person at a school in Germany, it was like right after that was no time at all. I started performing in Europe and stuff. What year? What year was that? Real quick. I'd say probably I think I started in 2005 and then because yeah, I mean, you, you did a lot of shows in Europe and I, I brought you to the international, uh, the Barcelona International Poetry Festival with with Bibby Hansen and Eugene Robinson. But the thing is, mm-hmm. we had never met. No. And so I had no idea. And what, I'm like, OK, I'm going to bring him. He could be a lunatic like his pieces, which are so bombastic and, and just is so fantastic. But you were as you are so kind and gentle and gentlemanly and we were all blown away because the minute you hit that stage bombs came out of your mouth about (laughs) real life trauma and uh and yeah i mean i was i was I was just so happy. But how did you start getting shows in in Europe? Because you were doing shows at like galleries or museums. I mean, you kind of just right off the start. Yeah, I mean, I did like a punk club called The Hideaway in Johnson City quite a bit. And that's where I would try out a new thing. And this was after I got banned from the coffee shop. They had like an open night poetry night, poetry night, like every Wednesday or something like that. But then they they told me they had a sign that said free speech zone, but it wasn't really not for you. (laughs) (laughs) They they didn't mean it. (laughs) uh, Was it was it your PCP poetry piece that got you banned? No, it was a small town dark secret about overweight girls sucking dicks to be accepted. And uh, they were like, (laughs) there was one day where the microbrewery, there was a microbrew beer company that was come. They came to 
let the owner try out free samples of all their different types of special beers. And they had just poured a whole bunch of them for this guy. And then I started doing this, telling the story about this girl uh, that lived across the street from me that was just really obese. And uh, she could, the only way she had friends was just by giving people blowjobs at night. Just different people would call her up and, uh, it was just really messed up. And my parents just thought, oh, this is wild teenagers having fun. So they would flash the porch light on and off. Oh. But it was like putting a strobe light on this like really messed up situation. It was really crazy. So that Whoa. story. But then like there were people, there were overweight girls there that were crying. But they were, whenever I do this stuff, I always... I'm not trying to hurt, re-victimize people or something. I'm trying to, I try to speak for them or something, like let people know what's going on. And so people would tell me like, oh, don't stop saying that. Keep people need to know. Thanks for telling us about this or something like that. But there was some Asian girls up front that were like laughing the whole time. Oh. And so then the... Um, they should they, have been banned. They should have been right. banned. Yeah. But then the people that were giving the free beers they were like i thought this was a cool place i thought this was supposed right. to be a cool place it's polarizing <laughs> and, in other words it's very polarizing and, and so then they said the owner said as long as it, if it costs me money he said it's free speech he says if it costs me a big chunk of money then it's no free speech like well that. i mean brian brian once again that is the difference between slam poetry open mic nights and stand-up tragedy which is mm -hmm. hello the space we occupy mm -hmm. and i don't know i don't think it'll ever be a popular commodity but somebody has got to tell the truth about some certain things. Yeah, but Brian, definitely. can I Brian, can I challenge you on this? Um, because uh, uh, I'm all for free speech and the expression and the expression that the way you express yourself. Can you tolerate someone who has a very different reaction than you intended the audience to have? Like like people just like snickering, maybe being um I don't know, yeah. sarcastic. I mean, can you tolerate just someone just oh. reacting uh, in ways that you did not intend for them to react? Oh, definitely. Uh, yeah. Uh, what I found when I after a while, I realized I was kind of preaching to the choir at most of the time. Anyways, the people that would come to my shows would be people that already had like conscious consciences and stuff like good you know like decent people and stuff but there would be like psychopaths in the audience that would totally take it the wrong way and be like damn man you make me want to cut the head off a monkey man you know or they would just totally take it, i can out masturbate you man i can do it right now i'm out masturbate you like just really like psycho people that just didn't get it at all and then um i started making more intense shows just for those type of people to try to give them panic attacks and then uh it worked uh it, but it would get kind of scary and then uh after that after a while i just decided well i'd rather be drawing and stuff <laughs> well, I, well, let me just, well you might hey, I, i'm glad that you're drawing but i just want to say going back to near-death experience and the other recordings that you've done. I mean, these are mandatory listening for anybody who's interested in, in spoken word. What was interesting is you said to me uh, in the email the other day, uh, because this is, you know, I, I just, you suddenly came into my head last week and I'm like, I have to get a hold of you because we haven't been in touch in a while. But then I remember back to Stephen Jesse Bernstein and, and, and then you said kind of in synchronicity that you during the pandemic had had a museum in your house to Stephen Jesse Bernstein, who was a spoken word poet who was on Sub Pop, whose album I think was called Prison. And now his son yeah. has a website yeah. for him. And I mean, I should consider you two, two of the most radically important spoken word artists. And I consider you two, that you two were the ones that felt like it gave me permission to, to be able to say whatever I wanted and stuff. Because growing up with the punk rock and stuff, I, people would say outrageous things like TSOL would say, I want to fuck the dead and stuff like this. But it was, it never seemed serious to me. It was always kind of like fun, the punk rock songs. Even the political ones were like f laughter and sarcasm and fun and stuff like that. And it wasn't until I saw a video of you uh, live and then and here in the prison uh, CD too, both of those things together was just like, wow, I can really say whatever I want. Like, this I is a real so, thing in America to do. You can really do it. I am so happy to hear that. And, you know, so so since uh, this rediscovering, remembering you coming back to you, I've been playing some stuff and sending your stuff to friends and they're just all blown away. So just now you're getting a whole new 
crew of people, because as you know, it's really hard to get any press in this country. And then we're, we're your documentary, The Art of Darkness, which is fantastic. I have to say it, it's really well done. I was really happy to see that. I had heard about it a while ago, and then I just remembered it. And that's I just, I just saw it today for the first time up for free on YouTube. And that mainly, which is to me, it's it's all you and mostly your self portraits with about five minutes of spoken word. But it's not boring at all because your concepts of what you do are so astute. And this is really portrayed in the writing that's in your books that I was talking about before, which are like the the month of color, uh, the uh, I forget the names of the, the ones that you sent, like the blindness, the month of blindness. Tell me the names of those five PDFs. Oh, uh, sexual arousal was yep. the first one. Right. And then uh, 30 days totally blind. And then uh, human temperature control. And then under the influence. And, 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 and we're going to talk. We're going to talk about that one in a minute. And under the influence. And then, and then the, the color months. Uh -huh. Right. And and what's interesting is and these books are all available on your website, I still have the copy of Sex, Drugs, and Institutions that you gave me a long oh, time yeah. ago. Thank that you was very the very much. first one ever. That's a rare <laughs> one. That's a rare one. Um, so these are all available. But what's amazing to me is, of course, just the documentation of the, the different types of self-portraits you're doing, but the writing in them is, I mean, you are, your writing is amazing, my friend, in expressing oh, absolutely what you're going through. Because this these are not just experiments. These are experiences that you are embodying to, and as you say, in one point you say, it's not that you're trying to put meaning to the experience. You're trying to find a way to preserve it and maybe transform yeah. it. Yeah, that's definitely what I'm going for. Because see, like they always say, uh, if you repeating the same behavior over and over again, expecting different results, this is you're insanity. Insane. <laughs> yeah, but, but if you really pay attention, you repeat the same behavior over and over again, it's going to be different every time if you really, really look closely. And uh, the more and more I did it, uh, the more and more I started seeing that um, there's these different elements of experience, like arousal, uh, valence, like uh, positivity or negative emotional type of thing, and uh, stress and focus. And each of those elements has different properties, components of them too, that can be isolated and stuff. And then once I started seeing these different types of properties, taking the main center stage of the different drawings each day, then I just my whole entire world opened up. And I was like, wow, the senses, all of the senses are like big giant frontiers that really haven't been explored with drawing at all. Um, you can look at a drawings and see like this is realistic or this is abstract. And, you know, people have different ways of disfiguring the human body and stuff. But the amount of information that can be communicated can be so much more uh, because most people like when they're drawing for, just take arousal, for example, this is when I like to say arousal on a scale of negative 10, which would be unconscious, and then positive 10, which would be like after doing like cardio until you can't even speak, uh, like really with you're like fearing a heart attack or something like positive 10 arousal. When most people are drawing, they're like negative one to positive one at the most. And so then you take artists like Paul McCarthy that get really super active in their drawing or like rolling or they're like in character rolling all over the floor and all this stuff, you know, d depending on what kind of shape he's in, he could maybe get up to a positive six, positive seven or something like this. But if you break it down into all 20, there's, you know, 20 different stages of arousal. Uh, to, to, to just, to, just, just an arousal body of work. If I was, I could spend a year just doing arousal and every month and still not be able to capture all of what it's the experience of being aroused is. And it's like that with every single thing now of, a, of the elements of experience. It's really, it's really something. So it's little things like that, that just keep me 
super mind blown and then going into what your temperature experiments were interesting. I had to laugh when you were doing temperature twister, which is exactly <laughs> what it is. But I mean, you were going through extremes of temperature and really challenging the body into shock and and possible, uh, you know, beyond even just the pain of shock of hot or cold water or temperatures, but a, a brutality that could exist beyond that. Like I was fearing while reading it that your skin could have got stuck actually to the bathtub and you could have pulled yeah. your ass you could have pulled your own ass off <laughs> <laughs> yeah it worried me a couple of times i mean i try to be safe and stuff like that but it, it things do <laughs> things do get kind of hairy sometimes like that <laughs> so uh, brian are you on any do you have to take any psychotropic or daily drugs to keep yourself you know balanced uh, no, I did. I was on Klonopins for like, God, probably 10 years or something. And um, they, uh, I stopped taking them after maybe seven years or something. And then uh, they, um, I started having this thing called partial seizures or something. Oh, wow. And then I had like migraines and stuff. I did cool drawings about it though. It's like, uh, I didn't mind the problems. Uh, I, they, they really were cool. And then uh, I did it again. I went back on them again. And now I'm off of them again, probably for good this time. What what was the what uh, brought you into the institution after prison, homeless for a while, and then you were institutionalized after your 600 mile journey on the Appalachian Trail? Yeah, uh, I went. Let's see which time. One time. The state mental hospital, Broughton State Hospital in North Carolina, I went there because uh, I was living with a girl and her ex-boyfriend was like breaking in and stuff and like he would be standing over the bed while you're sleeping and stuff like real psycho stuff. And then he was tried to, he tried to do a home invasion and I cut him coming through the bathroom window. But then he was in jail, but then I started... I don't know, I guess it's traumatic, post-traumatic stress or something. Like if the cat jumped off the counter, I'm thinking, oh God, I've got to cut this guy's nose off because he kept escalating and escalating. And I, by the time I cut him in the shoulder coming, he was half in and half out of the bathroom. I thought, what's next? I'm going to have to like disfigure him real bad. And because I didn't want to kill him, but the police in Asheville, uh, they said, um, they said, uh, well, you can kill him. The, the, to both of us, they said, if he breaks in and everything, you can kill him. You can do that's, whatever that's, you want. That's to the him. South. That's the South. Yeah. <laughs> they said you can do anything you want to him until we get here and stuff. And so I called uh, 911 when he was trying to break in. So I was on the phone. I had a utility knife in one hand and the phone in the other hand. And I said, did you hear that? He's coming in. And then he said, I'm going to cut him. And they said, stay on the line, sir. Stay on the line. And I said, I'm cutting him. And then I went over and I said, get the fuck out of here. Like in my spoken word type of voice. And, I, <laughs> and then I cut him and I said, I just cut him. <laughs> Cause I wanted everything to be on the 911 tape. Yeah. Oh, my blow and stuff. But it still was like really super pair, made me paranoid, schizophrenic, like hallucinate and all the time and everything so i went in there for that and then and then i went from there to some group homes and then my well, well let's talk about that for a minute so how long were you in for that and what what was what did they do did they just prescribe drugs to you i mean how did they how did you recalibrate yeah. yourself well when i was in there i was uh I'm not even sure. It wasn't too terribly long. It wasn't even probably two weeks. It was voluntary. The police didn't recommend me to go there. I just went on my own to the ER or something. It was like, I, I'm going to kill somebody and I don't want to kill anybody. It's not my responsibility to kill. You don't want to kill the wrong person, especially. I mean, yeah, a male man comes to the door and suddenly he's got no face. <laughs> yeah. And so then uh, when I was in the hospital, they put me on a Zyprexa, I think it was called, and uh, maybe like Ativan or something. I'm not really sure. I was, they made me like a zombie, but I could still draw. And so then I was drawing pictures of the staff's family for like 10 bucks and then using that at the vending machine for the other people that had no money and stuff and then uh, they let me leave the ward I was the only one in the ward that got to leave and so I could like walk around the building and draw pictures from outside and stuff like that and then and then I asked if I could teach art classes there and then they were like you don't need to be here anymore <laughs> it was like two weeks or something I was out of there okay 
but you knew you had to go and just take a break because your yeah. nerves were shattered from that experience because yeah. there was PTSD and yeah. an accumulative thing after all the other stuff that you had to deal with. Now, I want to talk about the series under the influence that you did. And it was another, again, a series of portraits where and I found this really interesting where once you're building, which is a very unique building that you live in with a lot of like, you know, interesting characters, shall we say, when they found out you were doing a project where you were going to do drawings under the influence of different drugs every day, they started to bring you drugs. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> some, drugs, some of the drugs I never heard of, but this, this is the most fascinating to me is, is you said your worst experience was on Seroquel. And look, I had only heard about that drug. I heard about it some years ago because two British gals approached me to do a narration about an anti Seroquel because the way that opioids are prescribed in America, Seroquel was prescribed in the UK, turned it into a zombie nation. So they made this little animated film that was anti Seroquel. Oh, wow. And that's the only time I'd ever heard about it. And then you said it was your worst experience when you were yeah, doing. Excuse me. Is it similar to ketamine? Because that, that's a, technically a tranquilizer as well. I've never tried the ketamine, but I would think it probably would. If it detaches your brain from your body, then it's pretty much the same. OK. I well, found it real disturbing. It, 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 I mean, I, I've never tried it and I never will. But I mean, these cows who researched that they were absolutely anti cervical What was your favorite uh, drug to do your experimenting with? Um, I like the ones that were like you said uh, in the film Xanax. Relaxer, you said, some, you, yeah, Xanax. Mm hmm. You said in the film. I mean, and, and also, you know, the, the mushrooms one was an interesting uh, portrait as well. Yeah. You, couldn't, you couldn't finish it. Yeah, right. it's just the pixels started flying off of my face, all radiating out of my face. And I was drawing it. I was hanging with it for a while, but then it just got to where it was just too much. And then I never went back to it. So, um, Brian, I, go ahead, Kim. No, no. I mean, there's a throughout the film, there, there's a constant theme of, um, you know, the house you're in is could be scary. And just seeing the scary angles of, of just one's perception from day to day. Do you like being scared? Do you think ultimately and subconsciously? And and, and 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 going with the whole the, the whole drug, uh, you know, different drug every day. Were you ever were you kind of attracted to the, the scary side of that as well? I mean, does it say I don't know if I even thought there was a scary side to it at first. And I don't know if I like being scared, but I like facing my fears. I like finding out what my fears are and then facing them. Uh but I don't know. I really don't think I like to be scared. I saw what was the movie? Phantom Thread. Have you seen that movie? No, I haven't seen it. Um, it was starring Daniel Day Lewis, and it was like a he was a fashion person or something. Well, I, when I was totally blind that month, my friends took me to see this movie. It was the scariest damn movie. <laughs> Wait, could, you saw you saw blindfolded. <laughs> Well, yeah, to, yeah, yep, yep, yep. And, and right. it, scared the, it scared the crap out of me. Like every single like if I heard someone's if I heard like someone set a glass down on a counter in a movie, I'm thinking this glass is going to break. Right. Or if, I, if someone starts the car, I'm thinking it's going to hit a tree or something like. But what was really scary uh, was that um, the movie, it seemed like the movie was the way it was doing sounds. And I've never noticed it since then was they would try to use the sounds in a way that would keep you focused on the screen, on the movie screen, like the way that would maybe fade out or the, the way they would yeah. fade in and stuff. There was something to it that was like attention grabbing on each sound. So it kept keeping me in this constant state of tension into the screen. And it and there would be times where the, the screen, it felt like it was advancing and getting closer and well, closer. Well, you know, it's, it's funny you mentioned that because, uh, you know, George Lucas always talks about this. He goes, most of the film techniques in modern day film <clears throat> were developed years ago. And it's really sound in the last 40 years. That's just gone in a whole other three dimensional level. And it, and the experiences I should do that. That's inspired me. I should check out a movie at a theater with, blindfolded. with blind, blindfolded and, and going back to the blindfold thing. Cause when people lose a sense, their other senses augment usually in more in the positive, meaning that they get more enhanced. How quickly did that set in, if at all? I mean, well, it seems like it did. How quickly did you start noticing your other senses being Amplified. heightened? Yeah. Uh, I'm not really sure. I know I did start smelling things better pretty fast because uh, I started having to um, 
do my trash a lot more. <laughs> and, uh, well, wait a minute, Brian. What about you saying that while you were blindfold, what during your blind period that you made some shake and bake barbecue chicken for your oh, friends? Boy. How did you yeah. even master that? You must be a great cook. You can do a blindfold. <laughs> well, one of my friends, uh, about probably right up in the front when I first started it, he said uh, he could take the knob off of the stove. So it was all the oven. So it was always set on 450. So if I bumped it, it would, I didn't have to right. not trust it that it wasn't going to be cooking right. But then what's funny is I thought I made the greatest barbecue chicken meal. But then after I wasn't blind anymore, I talked to my friends that came over for dinner that time and then got to describing it and everything. They were like, no, it didn't look like that because they'd never had shake and bake before. And they were like, no, it didn't look like that. And I was like, oh, it didn't. And then I went online and found a picture of a shake and bake where it was like kind of clumpy. And I was like, did it look like this? And they were like, oh, yeah. And I was like, oh, my God, I made my friends eat the nastiest. Looking. <laughs> but, but, you but you tasted you tasted it. So did it taste different? Fine. It tasted wonderful. All right. So, 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 so. <laughs> it was the, the presentation that uh, yeah, kind of. <laughs> uh, all right, Brian, we mentioned before this one performance that really blew me away. I don't know if it's still up online, but you said it was called Sign where and now this is what oh, I yeah, remember. Sign this, it. And I, I want you to I want you to refresh my memory. But what I remember is this and, and correct me when I when I go off the page is I think it was about these police were going to bust this trailer that a couple lived in, but it was the wrong trailer. But and they told the wife to get out. So she left somehow a tape recorder going and they were just saying, where is the drugs? Where is the money? We want it. And we're going to electrocute your balls if you don't give it to us. Somehow you got this tape. Right. And uh, then and then wait, I'm going to say, say it the way I remember it. You're going to okay. tell, fill in the blanks. So then you got this tape somehow. You got the audio recording of this tape. So then you go to a party in a trailer of a friend's house and you're wearing this T-shirt. Now, I seem to remember that the T-shirt you put over your head that was some kind of cross between a Ku Klux Klan and the boogeyman. And and while this cassette of the real police at the wrong trailers playing you have a video behind you of some woman signing we don't know what because we don't read sign language and when they get to the part where they're gonna uh electrocute the guy's testicles you actually do that and then how i recall it is your friend says well you sure know how to end a party <laughs> or maybe he said you sure, you sure know how to start a party i can't remember which name i don't remember you got most of that right i i was surprised you remember all that that's uh, crazy. How, how much <laughs> I'm, there is no equivalent. How am I supposed to forget that one? I just, well, and talk a little talk a bit about your bed bug performance, because this is another one I found really, really fantastic. So tell us about the bed bug performance. The that one, uh, my building got bed bugs. And then I'd already made a spoken word piece called bed bugs about this girl that I dated that was like cutting herself and stuff and uh, gave me nightmares. And then uh, and then a friend of mine had already made a piece of music called bed bugs. And so then when the bed bugs happened in real life, I was the new, like, wait, wait, the news, <laughs> the news, let, let me describe it because the news, there's a news report with a blonde bimbo on your new local news station going, we finally got rid of the bed bugs in whatever your building's called the Johnson arms apartments. And you were <laughs> like, no, they didn't. And you <laughs> go to the news desk and you say, you go to the news desk and this is this is the whole bed bug video and you go vampires are real they're bed bugs next thing you're in a ha you're in a hazmat suit in your apartment chopping up your own futon which is full of freaking bed bugs <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, how, how long did it take before the bed bugs well, were actually gone? You're laughing now, Brian, but hey, bed bugs are oh, no laughing no, matter. It was no joke at all. I was living fine. in plastic. I was living in plastic for a long time. Everything I owned was in plastic. I still keep my sketchbooks, my daily cell portrait sketchbooks, in plastic just in case uh, roaches or anything wants to come. Silverfish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I Ugh. just. You got but did stay. did they finally get rid of him in your building or you got rid know. of him in your building? I left, I left that building. I don't blame so you. I don't know. I, I'm in a nice one now. So, <laughs> so, so, so speaking of Johnson City, so I'm, I'm a little confused. I mean, you lived all, all these different places. You spent a lot of time in the D.C. area, Northern Virginia. When did you actually settle down in Johnson City? Uh, I went to ETSU. 
Oh, and then you, uh, and then, and then you just, yeah. and then you stay. When I left, I left Virginia. I'd gotten in trouble with the law and uh, went crazy there. Went to a mental hospital there, and then my uncle was living in Tennessee, in Blountville, which is about twenty miles or so from here. But he was living in a. It used to be an old hippie commune, but they'd turned it into a corporation or something now, and they'd have uh-huh. corporate meetings once every two years, and they'd get high and stuff. And uh, he was living on there as their caretaker. So I came and lived in the chicken coop for two weeks and then wow. I just couldn't take it anymore and then I went hitchhiking and then the police picked me up for hitchhiking and then ah. took me to the homeless shelter and then from the homeless shelter I went to the college and then from the college <laughs> I pretty much stayed here okay okay well, I've gone to other places since then well right, you, in between but like Asheville and China and stuff no no we got to talk about the, the China experience because this is just so fantastic so and, and you admit that occasionally you're prone to delusions of grandeur. Now, mm-hmm. tell us about the Chinese delusion of grandeur, because it's just <laughs> outrageous. I really believe that if I taught myself Mandarin and could come up with a comedy routine, I believe <laughs> that I could, um, within one year, have my own TV show. If I went to China where there was no tourists at all, just only Chinese speak, no white people at all, that I could like tell jokes and then become a superstar, like overnight success. And then within one year, I'd start doing blockbuster movies and everything. And uh, they did. I got there. And for two how weeks, did you, how did you get the money to go to China? I sold a lot of punk rock records from my nice actually. <laughs> on eBay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I sold my record collection on eBay. Who needs that crap that anyway? <laughs> it wasn't very expensive. Uh, China, it was really super cheap. Like I think at the airport back then in New York, it was eight dollars for a pack of camels. But then in China, it was 80 cents yeah. for right. a pack of camels. So it was like so you get to China. What up? <laughs> Well, the people couldn't understand me. They, the people could understand me, but I couldn't understand them at all because I hadn't taught myself how to hear it. But then once I realized they had like a basic syntax, they would say a whole lot of words, but in those words, you would hear like want, not want, or like, not like, have, not have, need, not need. And so then once I was able to pick up on just that key part of the syntax, then I was able to start hearing it really quickly. I was able you to studied it. You studied Amazing. Mandarin for many hours every, every day, day for, for months. nine months. Yeah, <laughs> which is, which is considered, no, nine you know, hours a day for six months. I think that, 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 there's a there's a, a um, nine months. I, can't I mean, that, that's one of the that's one of the hardest languages on the planet to, to learn if you're if English is your native uh, language. Um, but you but you could you manage to actually be, be able to function there. Amazing. Yeah. But they made me leave uh, because once I was there, I realized, though, they didn't have comedy, but then uh, <laughs> they, they didn't have stand up comedy. But the people I would meet everywhere I went, the people would say, I'd say, how much do you make at like the shoe store? I'd say, how much do you make? They say five hundred Chinese dollars. I go to the bakery. How much do you, you know, just not right up front, but talking to them for a half hour or something, the subject would come up. I said, well, how much do you make? They say five hundred Chinese dollars. Well, then I'd meet some people that were going to English school and I'd say, well, how much does that cost to go to English school? They say five hundred Chinese dollars. So then <laughs> I started going to the English schools. I went to three of them in Fuzhou and um, I would talk to the students and they were having to spend every single dollar that they made at this Chinese school, uh, at the English school, English school, yeah. English school. And so then um, the I just got the idea that I'm going to be the king of English schools. Over yeah. Ah. And so I started telling all of the students, OK, I'm going to start my own English school. I know words that they're not teaching you, like refill is real <laughs> important, uh, stuff like that. And so then they uh, I was looking at a building, an old abandoned elementary school. And I was telling them I'm going to charge you like, I can't remember, I was going to charge 200 or 300 Chinese dollars, something. But I said, I'm going to charge this much and I'm going to have all of the English students. I'm going to be the king of uh, English schools. And so then I went to the bank and I was really, really good thinking about it. I was looking at this, we had a penthouse apartment. It was $10,000 down and like 
twenty dollars a month for twenty years. And, and every, <laughs> this is real penthouse, nice uh, overlooking the city with hand engraved uh, sliding glass dividers with dragons and phoenixes and all this stuff, handmade chandeliers, everything for ten thousand down, twenty dollars a month for twenty years. And so then I was going into all about this stuff, and I was really getting amped up to do this. And then I go to the bank, and then all of a sudden I'm waiting in line, and I'm surrounded by all these like really irate uh, uh, owners of all these different English schools. There was five <laughs> of them. Oh boy. And uh, they're just like, what are you doing? Who do you think you are? You're a, <laughs> You're a monkey. Who do you think you are? What are you doing here? And stuff like that. But I felt safe in the bank. So I was like, I'm going to be the king of English schools. You're ripping the students off. You're charging. They make $500 at the bakery. They make $500 at the, cha- at the shoe store. And now they're paying you $500. They might not even be able to go work at a restaurant somewhere. They might not ever be able to leave China. You're ripping the kids off. I'm going to t- charge them half as much. I'm going to be the king of English schools. <laughs> and uh, it, it wasn't much been longer. It would have been great if it happened. <laughs> yeah. But then it, w- it wasn't much longer. Uh, the police ma- made they escorted me to the airport and I was asked to leave. Wow. I mean, that day at the bank, they escorted no, you to the airport? No, it was only like a few days, a few days later. They, they know who you are. Yeah, you, you know, I'm, I'm surprised, you know, just with the, the influence of uh, UK culture and Hong Kong, at least Hong Kong, I would think there'd be some kind of stand up comedy, but I guess I guess there might be now by now there might be. I was shocked that there wasn't, Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of countries in general that their stand up comedy doesn't isn't rooted in what we perceive, you know, the modern post vaudeville. And so, you know, that idea, you don't don't necessarily throw that out. There's other countries you could pursue. You could actually successfully. Uh, uh, Brian, do, do you like stand up comedy? Uh, no, no, no. Really. <laughs> I, mean, I like some of them. I, I like sometimes as funny people and stuff like that. Like but who? I felt- St- Stephen Wright? Who? He's not funny, but I like him. Well, I think there was Bill Hicks. And uh, sure, he was there great. Was he the, wasn't um, funny. <laughs> George, George Carlin, they were George funny. Carlin. <laughs> Richard, Richard Pryor. Richard Pryor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, Richard Pryor was stand up tragedy. Yeah. I mean, just, just him talking, talking about his life. Oh, shoot. When I was a little kid, uh, my mom told me not to go to Penguin Feather Record Store because they sold like bongs and stuff in there. And uh, I snuck over there one time and got uh, Richard, Pry- uh, no, Eddie Murphy, uh-huh. comedian or something like that. Oh, so yes. I don't know how old I was. I was probably preteen or something. And this was the funniest thing I'd ever oh, yeah. in my life. Oh, my Brian, insane. Brian, what, what artist influenced you? you? You mentioned Chris Burden before. Like, who did you uh, first of all, how did you even find out about him? And who, who you know, as a teenager or, or when you started going to the university, who caught your eye? I would say at the university, I found out about a lot of those people, but they didn't teach us a lot about the more extreme things in Tennessee, they don't teach, but uh, you, you just find out about it over time. Some surprise exhibits at the Hirschhorn, like Open My Eyes Up, Bruce Nauman, uh, Morton Kippenberger, and uh, uh, I'm trying to think who else. But as far as like, since then, I've learned a lot more about art since post university or whatever. Uh, John Duncan has been a huge inspiration on me. And uh, actually, the last spoken word piece I did was with John uh, under the influence of torture. Did you see that one? I didn't see it, but I can't wait to. And I know John Duncan. because, And again, he's somebody, he's an American who's been exiled to Europe because there's no way he could do his performances or sound experiments in America. It just It's not going to happen. And yeah. then also you went on to work with Zev, who, who I loved. I mean, Zev the percussionist yeah. was amazing. Yeah. And he was fantastic. How did you yeah. start getting interest in your, in your, uh, artwork to have shows in like Tel Aviv. How does somebody in Tel Aviv contact you about having an exhibition? Just through the email, but uh, really, uh, my girlfriend and I were just talking about this. I'm I'm probably the most interviewed drawer in the world, but the least exhibited (laughs) drawer in the world. Is that because of the documentary? You think the documentary drew that attention? No. Okay. Well, I I don't know. No, the drug pictures uh, is what the people mostly come for but then they once they look into it they find out all this other stuff that i did and so then the interviews are about other things all the time but uh the 
um, but other, I wanted to say too, like Linda Montano, uh, she did uh, different color uh, years and stuff. And so there's been like other uh, people uh, that there's been a whole lot of artists. Yeah, that you became aware of after you started doing what you do. One thing I wanted to ask you was probably maybe after you got to New York uh, the first time, there was an artist that they it's called Derching Shea. Do you know him? I, I don't. Sam. I don't. Uh, in the early. Oh, Sam I. Yeah, Sam. I think. Yeah. People call him. S A M. Him. Yeah. But um, I never knew him though. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's like a big inf influence on me too. My, my favorite artist from that period in New York was David Warsnerowitz, who was a. Oh yeah. He's my favorite. And I did the last spoken word show with him before he died. And he's just my favorite. And I, I do a. I do a reading of of one of his pieces from the Waterfront Journals with Tim's band Grid. We have a oh, wow. unreleased. Un, I'm going to send it to you. Unreleased spoken word record where oh, I am. Wow. It started during the lockdown uh, and two of my pieces. And I'm reading pieces by Henry Miller, John Retchy and David Wars. Oh, it. I'm going to send that to you. Wow, how did definitely. you get, how did you get an offer to lecture on uh, on uh Drugs and society, art, drugs and society at the University of Mississippi. How did that come? Uh, out? The teacher just contacted me in the email. Uh, but that that one, that was the first time I ever really did it. I've done like artist talks at a couple ex exhibits before, but um, they, uh, she, um, just invited me to do it, and I did. Never you enjoy done that? Before. Did you like oh, yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to do it more. I was hoping it would really, uh, my career would take off doing this type of thing more. But then the pandemic hit. But like so many, the whole auditorium was packed when I was there. And uh, the teachers said that in ten years, some of the teachers had been there for ten years, and they said they'd never seen an artist talk where the students weren't on their phones for in ten years. They'd oh, never seen beautiful. that. Where yeah, they said they were captivated the whole time well that so. means you that means you you can hold a crowd do you get synesthesia when when you listen to music do you do you, do you see shapes you see images no but i i feel them i think maybe other people don't but to me it seems normal but like pains and stuff i can see i see sh i don't see shapes like hallucination right. shapes right. but if i like think inside my body like how something feels it feels in like shapes and lines and moving lines and things like that pressures and different tones values and stuff so i don't know if other people can do well that I, mean, I mean yeah I'm, but yeah Anyhow, do you listen uh, to music when you're drawing brian uh yeah sometimes i do uh -huh. what kind of stuff yeah. i'm sure it always changes but any reese any favorite and what was the latest thing you've been listening to or Let's see. I just found out about Killing Joke. Oh, oh yeah, first classic. Time. classic huh? <laughs> 52 years old and just discovered well, Killing that's, Joke. That's cool, though. <laughs> you, know, you know, if all music stopped tomorrow, uh, none of us could get through what's already been made. So that's a beautiful thing. <laughs> but you, you said you sold yeah. a lot of your punk rock records that meant you were into punk rock at one point. Yeah, uh, they uh, yeah, punk and uh, reggae type stuff, but more like dance hall, more vocal type dance hall stuff. And then I'm um, trying to think I, I like I like I like the people that are masters of their instrument and I like them alone, like Thelonious Monk alone or Cecil oh, Taylor of course. solo, yes. you know, this type of thing where the person is just doing it with their media. That's what I'm most into. Tim does a lot of solo bass. I do, I do a lot of solo stuff. Yeah. I, and, 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 you know, when Cecil was alive uh, here in Brooklyn, you know, he, he was pretty out there. There's a couple bars you'd hang out at and you could roll with him wow. till five in the morning. He, he was very, uh, wow, you know, I, very I inclusive, opened, I, sociable. I, I, I opened for him once. Wow. At, the, at UCLA. At the, yeah, Whoa. I did. And, and John Sinclair was on the the bill, but I came wow. out with one of my war things and then Cecil Taylor played. Wow. Although, 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 although Thelonious Monk. Oh, my God. You know, Thelonious Monk oh was institutionalized God. a few times. I mean, I mean, uh, Thelonious Monk, who's like maybe my favorite jazz musician ever. Um, you know, he had to deal similar experiences, but similar, some similar experiences of being institutionalized, having runs with the law, but still sticking to his craft and 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 being resilient. And, uh, you know, when I hear about someone like that or yourself, I, I, I just have all the, you know, so much respect 
because the filter is out in the planet. And as soon as you walk out the door, especially if you're an artist, the whole world's basically saying no. And then you also have just things like aggression, like cops and people to be able to see it through is, is really impressive. And that's one thing I got from the documentary of how resilient you actually are. Which is you know, oh, well, Brian, you are your own anti institution. You are your own uh, theater of non cruelty based on other people's cruelty. And you are Toby and one of my favorite writers who did unfortunately end up in the insane asylum and that, you know, you you basically are your own. I'm going to say circus with the utmost respect because it goes through so many different at, you know, life defying <laughs> acts. You're always on the tight rope. You're always doing the trapeze. Oh, you're experimenting like a knife thrower and you're trying to cut out and cut through the bullshit and right. cut out the core that is, again, not that the not to just not to decipher completely the meaning of the matter of the experiment, but that to preserve it and transmute beyond it. But yeah, and let other people, I want uh, to communicate it to other people so that they can see it and understand it and say like, oh, wow, this is really, you know, a, a, a different observational perspective or something on. Well, on, and sometimes on. we're doing the work so other people don't have to. Like, I always think I am the I am the mouth for other people who who can't find their voice to scream. So you are doing these experiments and trying to trying to see exactly how much the human body within itself can can withstand, but not just as a masochist, but as an experimenter of the highest order right. to see what effects happen <laughs> under different circumstances. Yeah, and, and it's not really new because a lot of artists have done that. But what I found kind of disheartening was like these other artists that do, do like endurance and durational art and put their bodies through like body art type stuff. They that is the work of art. Like when Chris Burden was shot, he said the bullet passing through his skin was the work of art. He didn't like really write about it and draw pictures about it and describe the feelings of what went through and stuff. And, and then like when people like that guy, uh, Sam, uh, uh, was uh, living outside for a year outdoors and could never go inside for a single year. He had like a maps of all the places he walked and photographs of himself, but then there's no other information because that was the work of art. But I feel like it would be nice to know what he learned, what he went through, like all of the, th there's a whole lot of information in the experiences that are missing that I think are, could be artful too, that are well, I, no, no, I'm going to say are very artful because you're so articulate in what's going on. And not only, not only the, the experience, experiment you're doing, but the true experience of what it is to go through these, and I'm going to say endurance test, just to see not only what the body can withstand, but how it affects, you know, the intellect, the differences, the brains, the, yeah. the, the emotions, you know, and, and this is, look, when we start, when we start dealing with trauma and we're, and we're talking about how, for instance, the cortisol affected us, you're going beyond that with these things. We're going beyond PTSD into, and I love that one of your, like hot, your temperature experiments, as we know, they do this in, in torch and prisons in uh, torture camps, get mo all the time yeah oh and God. nobody there is allowed the voice to describe not only the emotional devastation and obviously we are not them we can't even speak for them but you are still putting yourself in extreme situations yeah and even if challenge. you see even if you see a video or a photograph of it you still don't get that insider information that drawing and writing and uh, uh, other forms of art can do and um this year is going to be really epic um i'm doing uh, i'm calling 2022 the year of the eyes and um i've got nine months worth of extended wear contact lenses so i don't have to wear glasses for 30 days straight for nine times and i've got prisms and different kinds of prisms oh boy. and different kinds of goggles from a company in Moscow. And um, I'm going to do 30 days upside down world. 
world where my feet oh. are upside down coming at me when I'm walking, walking towards me. And, and then I've got a right, left, reverse, like flip horizontal 30 days. And then I've got, I'm going to do um, 360 <laughs> degree aerial view. Oh my God. And then 360 degree aerial view reversed. So what's behind me appears in front and what's on my right is actually on my left and stuff like that. Would that give you I've vertigo got- maybe potentially? So potentially yeah. uh, you could get vertigo and then it will. And then what? Yeah. It Again, right this is away. a sensory circus that you you're really going into the sensory it, circus. The eyes. Yeah. I'm yeah. going to break my eyes so I can see better. That's what I'm telling myself. And uh, I'm I'm really, really thinking this is going to be really big for for me personally, because the, everything is just when you're born, you see right side up all the time. And I mean, they've been, psychologists have been putting upside down goggles on people for over a hundred years. Uh, and a couple of them have even put them on themselves and like written books and essays about it and stuff. And th- th- it's, it's like a real thing. So I'm hoping that I can kind of bridge the gap more with the arts and the sciences or something and really show people what the vertigo f- feels like or how what what's happening visually to make me have these inside feelings and stuff or however whatever happens happens i'm gonna go for it brian lewis saunders you are my favorite living artist my favorite spoken word tragedian my favorite conceptualist and i am so happy to have had you on the lydian spin (laughs) Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you for being a guest. <laughs> Pleasure talking to you.